everyone. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Soma Sahai. Dr. Sahai is a board certified headache specialist and advocates an integrated approach to management of headache disorders. Dr. Sahai has established a multidisciplinary headache and atypical facial pain program at USC that specializes in dealing with complicated and challenging cases. She has a UCNS certified fellowship program in headache medicine. Her clinical research focuses on migraine, headache disorders, and neuromuscular disorders. Dr. Sahai has participated in many clinical trials as principal or co-investigator relating to her areas of specialization. She has published numerous articles in scientific journals on topics relating to headache, neuropathic pain, and neuromuscular diseases, and is a regular contributor to the web-based peer-reviewed portal, webmd.com. Welcome, Dr. Sahai. Hi. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Soma Sahai, and I will be speaking for the next 20 minutes about your migraine symptoms and neuroscience. So um, I do appreciate the organizers for inviting me among my fellow migraineurs, and it's a privilege and an honor to speak to you. So um, I'll be moving the slide a bit. Um, here are my disclosures. The goal today is to get a bird's eye view of events in the brain during a migraine attack, and then try to answer questions like, why me? Why such a plethora of symptoms besides headache? Why do I have brain fog? That's a tall order in 20 minutes, but let's do it. I do apologize if some of the slides seem very simple to some of you. Uh, who may know a lot more in depth about certain topics in, within the migraine world, and also for some other slides that may seem a little bit too complicated, but I'll try to hit a balance. So let's start with just basics. We all know migraine is not just a headache. We are the sufferers, right? Migraine is an inherited neurological disorders, uh, disorder, and in the next slide, we will discuss a little bit about what's happening there. And it is characterized by an underlying state of increased responsiveness. So the word sensitive brain is being used a lot nowadays in the migraine world. And it does sort of uh, explain in a nutshell what's happening. So there is increased responsiveness of brain networks that amplify the intensity of your sensory uh, stimuli. So it's a syndrome, meaning it's a hodgepodge of various um, phenomenon, and one of them is sensory function, affect, meaning your mood, cognition, and autonomic function. So let's tackle the genetics of it first. It is clear that 90% of migraineurs have a genetic background. However, only 40% um, have an autosomal dominant trait, meaning um, they have a first or second degree relative who clearly has a migraine history. And what about the rest? So there have been a lot of studies. Initially, there were only family studies. So you would look at a family cohort of um, a specific migraine, which is usually a severe type, for example, hemiplegic migraine, and then trace all the genes within that family or a bunch of families. But now we have this genome-wide association studies, which um, the main researchers is in Australia, and they have collected 60,000 cases um, of migraine sufferers and looked at their entire genome and then control, compared it to the controls, meaning people without migraine. And so there is a lot of new technology which makes it easier. There are single cell RNA sequencing where you can actually look at a single cell and each gene within a different type of cell. And what we found is that there are so many different genes that are implicated um, for migraine uh, or associated with migraine. And they are doing various functions and are in different parts of the nervous system. So there may be genes that are part of the blood vessel, vascular system, the synapse or the ion channel. And then in fact, there might be genes that are associated with migraine that are part of your circadian clock. And so as an example, you may be waking up with migraine, whereas somebody else may never wake up with a migraine. So it seems like there are different genes that um, work on different functions. And therefore, it is clear that that's one of the reasons why migraines vary among individuals. 
and looking at this picture, which is, seems very complicated, if you look at the very innermost circle, uh, or square rather, with all the red numbers in there, um, which basically shows you there are the four basic genes that are causal, which we found, um, which cause the severe forms of migraine, which is hemiplegic migraine. And the, all the other genes may be susceptibility, meaning they may be um, associated with a migraine, but we don't really clearly know why um, and what is, um, and so there are a lot of research that needs to be done about that. There are genes associated with vascular function, neuronal function, ion channels, pain sensing genes and so forth. So you see the picture is very complex, but I do think that in the next decade, we will be able to do a sort of like a 24 me study of a genetics of, of each one of us and look at which gene is causing my migraine and then tailor the treatment to it. So there's a lot to be said about genes. Let's go over the migraine attack, the intensity of symptoms um, or phases. As we all know, there initially there is a prodrome, um, then an aura, and then a headache with this associated feature, and post -trome. Clearly, migraine is a brain disorder. It's a neurovascular problem, not just of the blood vessels, but of the nervous system. And there is a state of neuronal hyperexcitability, especially in the back of your brain, the occipital cortex where our vision center is, which makes the brain susceptible to migraine attacks. So let's talk about phase one, the prodrome. Even before you get a migraine, you'll have up to three days where there'll be fatigue, mood changes, food craving, yawning, muscle tenderness, all sorts of non-specific things that could be specific to you. This points to the involvement of the hypothalamus as a potential origin of migraine attack. And we will talk about that and show you where it is. Um, other areas of activation include brainstem, the emotional system, the cortical system, which is responsible for executive functioning, speech and language areas. Going to phase two, only some people have migraine aura. I've never had a migraine aura in my life. So about 15 to 20% of patients will have a migraine aura. And the reason uh, we wanna spend some time on migraine aura is it's the best way to study migraine because it tells you exactly when a migraine is starting or about to start. So there have been imaging studies, there are animal studies and so forth to look at what is happening inside the brain when you're having an aura. So migraine aura is an electrical event in the brain. It's called cortical spreading depression. And it's interesting, it's a wave that spreads across the surface of your brain at the rate of two to six millimeter per minute on the surface of the brain. There is a change in chemical flow within the neurons, resulting in electrical signaling, which leads to change in blood flow. So hold that thought. Um, we'll look at some imaging on MRI. There are many types of migraine aura. The commonest is a visual aura. And then there is sensory aura, less common, speech and or language aura, motor, brainstem, which includes Again, speech difficulties, vertigo, dizziness, uh, tinnitus, meaning you can hear some little sounds in your um, uh, in your ears, double vision, balance problems, hearing problems. The last one is rare. It's called retinal um, aura, which basically involves one eye suddenly having a visual problem, not being able to see or seeing blocks and dots. Here's a picture of a very famous picture of uh, migraine for uh, aura, visual aura, which is called fortification spectrum. And it looks like a fort um, and it is equated to a, a picture of a fort in Italy. The interesting thing about auras is no matter your age, your sex, gender, height, weight, what country you're from, what race you are, all auras are very systematic, specific, and stereotypical so that's the very interesting part and that is because in the brain what's happening is the same in every brain here is a, a drawing of the how the aura evolves and you see the zero is zero minutes or zero seconds rather and then at three and then seven seconds and then 10 seconds it see how it evolves in a very systematic pattern so something is happening in a very systematic manner in the brain. Um, 
This one is a 19th century drawing of the fortification spectra on the left side. It shows you how it's expanding. And then uh, the other pictures are similarly showing how it evolves. Now, interestingly, in nine, the 1900s, when the first printer came on and mass printing became um, very common and people were started reading more, uh, the use of the printed page was able to reveal the uniformity of migrant scotoma. So uh, people who were reading the, uh, the books would notice and be able to visualize and explain the scotomas. Here is another picture. Um, the left side, it shows the little zigzag lines and the right side is blurred. The interesting thing is that migraine aura can look and feel and like a stroke but it is reversible. It's very scary when it happens, but it is reversible. Now, if you are wondering how another aura, for example, a seizure or epileptic aura would be different, it's totally different. Um, it's here are a few illustrations up there, and you see that it's not the same sort of patterning that you see in a migraine aura. So again, there's something specific happening to your brain when you're having an aura. There are many, many visual hallucinations of migraine that have been described. Um, micropsia, meaning smaller than what is real. Macropsia, in images enlarged um, more than normal. Metamorphosia, meaning the picture is actually totally distorted and out of body experiences. So on the right, you'll see a picture where a slight part of the face has disappeared. And those of you who have read the Alice in Wonderland book or um, watch the uh, movie, there are uh, there is a whole process, thought process that the author was describing his auras, migraine visual auras. So how Alice looks and sees a very small, um, you know, pictures of the rabbits and so forth, and then she sees huge objects and pictures, and then the central picture is how her face is totally distorted. All those were were describing auras. In fact, I have a patient who told me how she, during an aura, will see herself in out of body experience sitting on an outside bench in a park, and she could vividly describe all her, you know, elements and how she's sitting and what she's feeling. Very odd for her. So, what's happening in your brain when you're having a migraine aura? If you look at the brain waves it's called an eeg you will see on the left side there's line strong squiggly lines and as the aura progresses there is a depression so everything sort of flattens out and on the right side you'll see how the, uh, what it illustrates is there's a leakage of chemicals now and then that leakage of chemicals causes an electrical signal that travels up to the front of the brain and that was is what the two to six millimeter per minute rate of progression and that's why when you're seeing your auras it's progressing at a very certain specific rate uh, now with uh, better imaging for example what is called a functional mri you people have been able to actually map this um, and on the top image you'll see a how um, it starts in the occipital cortex the back of the brain and on the right side you'll see how um, the squiggly lines are progressing at a very specific um, in a specific manner so this is a video which i love because it shows in real time how when a person is having their migraine aura the a wave of electrical activity is um okay maybe it'll work now so I mean, only in the last decade were we able to capture this in real time and really prove that what's happening to your vision is a reflection of what's happening inside your brain. So look how the lightness is expanding and it's crossing into different brain territories. Okay, that's the end of that, I think. All right. So there are other auras that are not so common. One is called the sensory aura, where you typically see, um, along with the visual issue, visual issue, you will see a, um, or feel rather, paresthesias, which is tingling, 
numbness and so forth that starts at the tip of your finger and it may progress upwards again in a very systematic fashion and then it goes away in a similar fashion. Hemiplegic migraines are the most scary. That's when one has weakness or paralysis on one side of the body. And it should be accompanied by a visual aura generally, vision issues, sensory auras, and then the paralysis. It feels like um, stroke and it's very scary, but it is reversible and it is not a stroke. So what about migraine without aura? What about people who don't have auras? I've never had auras in my life. Is common migraine, which is what it's called, if you don't have an aura, is it a brain disorder? How do we prove it? And the answer is yes, it is a brain disorder. So this was, a, I love telling this story because in 1995, a very happy accident or accidental discovery where a woman was getting um, in a scanner, a scan for metastatic breast cancer. And then during that event um, of scanning her, she started having a migraine. And they took her out of the scanner, gave her some Imitrex, which was available at that time, and then headache disappeared and went back into the scanner. And the whole event was imaged. And you see in the middle of the picture, there are these red areas, which is the first time we discovered that there are areas in the brain uh, that can be activated or lighted up when you're having a migraine. And this was not a migraine with aura. And so it was labeled, these various areas of the brain were labeled migraine generator. And there are a bunch of names down there. Um, so that was the first time we discovered that the brainstem is a, such an important part and maybe it's initiating migraine, we're not sure. Recently, we have realized, remember hypothalamus, we talked about hypothalamus being uh, what may be responsible for the prodrome uh, before you have a migraine with the nausea or um, the uh, yawning and other um, symptoms. So the hypothalamus is really the master of the master gland. It is in yellow and right in the middle of the screen. And it, it seems to be activated even before a migraine of headache or is triggered. Um, now, the hypothalamus is the generator for a lot of functioning. So it is, um, it uh, organizes and it controls your um, endocrine system, your hormones, um, your emotions, your mood, and there is a lot of um, activity that hypothalamus regulates. What happens if you don't have a migraine and we just rub chili pepper on your forehead, which is what you do to distinguish migraine pain from non-migraine pain? So if you would do a PET scan or a functional imaging of such a person's pain, you would not see activity in the middle, which is either the hypothalamus or the um, brainstem, you would see it other places. So that's how we know. I love to tell my patients, if we want to really prove that you have migraine and not sinus headache or allergy headache or something else, then we just put you on a very expensive scanner and we can distinguish it. So this, card, uh, this uh, picture is quite um, busy, but this is what's happening at the cellular level when we're actually experiencing a migraine. So number one is the top of the um, picture where, or the middle of the picture where there is um, the hypothalamus, which is the master of the master um, gland. And then number two is below, which is called the uh, brainstem area, called the trigeminal caudalis nucleus, which is very important for migraine. And then as we see that this activation of these two pathways results in um, looking at the blood vessel area, there is dilatation of blood vessels and there's a, a sudden spill of chemicals on your, the surface of your brain. And two of the uh, chemicals are listed here, CGRP and PAC-38. And then the third one, pay attention to mast cell, that's gonna be our friend later on in the talk. So what is CGRP? It's a shortened version for calcitonin generated peptide. It's everywhere in your body. It's uh, in the heart, the kidney, but now we've discovered it's the key player for migraine. If uh, IV CGRP is injected, it causes a migraine. If you block CGRP, it prevents a migraine. Um, and it seems like a lot of the features of a migraine attack and the headache are due to high CGRP. So on the left, you see a normal brain 
and there is normal light, sound, smell, and uh, sensation, sensitivity, whereas on the right side, if one has high CGRP in your uh, blood circulation or your brain, then you would have light sensitivity or phonophobia, uh, photophobia rather. Phonophobia is noise sensitivity, nausea, and all the other features of a migraine. So seems like CGRP is the main sort of culprit behind uh, the throbbing headache and all the features during the, a, a migraine attack. And then recently, in, in just a few months ago, uh, there was this a very interesting article about this channel called the Piso channel. So how does CGRP cause a headache when it's not a pain chemical? How does it get the pain receptors activated. So it seems like the piezo channels or the piezo channels may be sort of the window. These are channels. So you see on the left side, a normal brain without migraine where these red blood vessels and blue nerves. And these channels are spread all over uh, the nerves and the blood vessels, and they're separated. Now, when you have a migraine where all this CGRP is being spilled and there's swelling of the brain, everything swells up and they get close together. So now the piezo channel opens up and it's a mechanical channel. So when the stretching of the blood vessels is happening, it stretches the channels and it opens the channels. And here comes histamine and all these pain chemicals are now, now released into the system and then you feel pain. So CGRP is operating not directly, but through a whole variety of channels is the message here. Switching gears, what about neck pain and migraine? So during a migraine, I have neck pain and my neck pain could trigger migraine. It is quite clear that it's a big relationship. And here's a picture which might explain it. So on your face, the nerve for pain is called the fifth nerve and it has several branches. The one, it goes into the eye, two goes into your nose and three goes into your jaw and that ultimately terminates into this area of the brainstem called the TCC or TMC, uh, which is in the tract, yellow tract, that you can see in the middle of the picture. Now, the neck um, pain is transmitted by the occipital nerve. And guess where both of these terminate? They both terminate in the same place in the brainstem called the TNC. So it's a bi-directional problem. So a neck pain can trigger migraine through um, forward flow, and a migraine can trigger pain, is what we uh, know so far. What about the allodynia and the scalp sensitivity that I get during a migraine? So often people will not be able to touch the area of the scalp that uh, where the migraine starts. And then if you touch, there will be extra sensitivity. So a touch may create pain. Um, this is because of peripheral sensitization. So everything that you've heard about all these peripheral nerves that you see, the nice pictures on different parts of your skull. Um, they're part of the uh, trigeminal nerve, nervous system. They get super sensitized and you already heard about all the different chemicals, some of the chemicals rather, that cause a sensitization. So these peripheral nerves become super sensitive, either um, from a peripheral process, meaning sometimes if you just have minor facial trauma, it could trigger migraine. How does it do that? Um, because it feeds back into the central nervous system that we saw. Moving on to brain fog, it is an inability to concentrate on mul or multitask. Um, there's reduced mental sharpness. There is short and long-term memory loss. And Surprisingly, it's not just a feature of migraine. It can be present in a variety of uh, different um, conditions that may or may not be related. So fibromyalgia, POTS, which is a postural tachycardia syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, celiac disease, chemotherapy uh, can cause brain fog. Early stages of Alzheimer's, we know that. Autistic um, disorders, so there's a whole spectrum of that. So why brain fog? Um, recently, we're getting an inkling that it may be due to inflammation. So inflammation and immune system, they seem to be a common sort of pathway here. And it is caused by release of histamine from our friend, the mast cell, which is present in the brain. Now, what triggers inflammation? Anything. Stress, 
environmental toxin, allergens, uh, and so histamine is very important for alertness, motivation, learning, memory, but too much histamine, for example, by food triggers can shut the system down and that can cause brain fog. Here's a picture on the top with a big old mast cell, which is releasing histamine. And guess what? This is the main player in allergy. So people who think, well, my allergy triggered my migraine, or uh, you may hear somebody say, well, when the I see the purple flowers or certain pollen, then I get migraine. So it's an allergy, not migraine. So mast cell is basically a very important player in all this. And so mast cell, as you can see, is present in the neuron, around the neuron, in the brain area, and on the surface of the brain. And it causes inflammation. And so that ends up causing brain fog. This is just a cartoon to explain that there are multiple mechanisms of migraine. It's not to confuse us, but to just, again, reiterate that on the one hand, on the left side, you could have uh, people are triggered by a certain odor, for example, and it can trigger a nose receptor called the trip receptor that can cause inflammation and ending up in sensitization and inflammation of the blood vessels, or it can happen at the level of the neurons within the brain. And on the right side, you have the whole neck muscle tension, which then travels up and down. Now the brain stem has on and off cells, and there's a whole circuitry where the brain stem is supposed to stop or off the descending pain uh, pathway, but sometimes it doesn't. And so why does migraine become chronic? Here's an even more complex cartoon because migraine is very complex and it's trying to put the whole picture of the whole entire pathway in one picture, which is very hard. So on the left side, you see migraine trigger would be central or peripheral, your neck. And then we talked about the cortical spreading depression, which we see in some migraine patients with the aura. And on the right hand, you see how there is a subcortical or brainstem that is really involved. Um, and remember, brainstem is also the center for balance. It's the center for hearing. So people who have dizziness and balance problems and hearing extra sounds during a migraine, it is because it, it is the same pathway. And then moving down further, you have activation of the hypothalamus, which regulates your fight and flight response and your rest and relax response. So the hypothalamus also regulates your circadian rhythm. So then that is another explanation of why you wake up all the time with migraine versus somebody may fall asleep uh, in the evening and have migraines. Um, and so then there are all these chemical mediators that are in the lower part of the picture. And ultimately, it's a state of sensory hyperactivity. So all types of sensation, smell, taste, hearing, and so forth. So in summary, migraine is a whole nervous system disease. Um, and there is sensitivity or sensitization of both the peripheral and the central pathways of migraine pain circuit. Now, important areas of migraine pain circuit include the brain stem, which we discussed, the trigeminal system, the hypothalamus, and sensory pathways, just a few of the ones that we discussed today. And some of the key mediators of symptoms, and there are many, we discussed just two of them. One is histamine and CGRP. And with that, I will end. This is our uh, picture of our entire group at USC. We have nine headache providers or headache specialists, we have pain psychology, and we do a multidisciplinary team approach, which we really believe in. And I do appreciate your time. Thank you. So for our next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sheena Arora. Dr. Arora has nearly 30 years of experience working and teaching in the field of neurology and extensive research experience in the mechanism of migraine and clinical trials. Prior to joining Impel, Sheena was a senior medical fellow with global health leaders at Eli Lilly. She previously served as clinical associate professor neurology at Stanford University School of Medicine. A national leader in headache research and treatment, 
Sheena was the lead investigator for the preempt one trial, which left to the, led to the FDA approval of Botox to treat chronic migraine and has participated in numerous additional clinical trials, including being the lead investigator in the MAP studies, as well as being a lead author on the publications. She then served as director of the headache clinic at Henry Ford Hospital for four years before becoming co-director of the Swedish Headache Center at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute in Seattle, Washington. Sheena was voted as one of the best doctors in Seattle Magazine's Seattle Best Doctors in 2010 and 2011, and currently served in five professional societies. Welcome, Dr. Aurora. Thank you, Marcia, for that very kind introduction. And it's a big privilege to share this stage with my colleagues today. I um, really enjoyed uh, Dr. Sahai's um, lecture, and I'm hoping to really quickly piggyback um, on it. So um, thank you very much uh, for setting the stage. Soma, I really appreciate it. So when we think about the autonomic dysfunction in migraine, you just heard that migraine is a disease of the brain in which the brain is hypersensitive. Um, uh, Dr. Sahai shared with you the genetic um, uh, predisposition that somebody has for migraine, and that leads to a hypersensitivity or a hyperexcitability in the pain pathways. Thus, when there are triggers that are married in the right way, um, you know, those of us who have migraine get migraine, and those people who have not um, experienced migraine, they don't have that genetic predisposition. So it's that same predisposition that actually leads to a dysfunction in the autonomic system. The autonomic system, you might think of it as the more silent part of the brain. So you don't really um, think about your controlling your heartbeat or you can uh, controlling your GI or your uh, gut function. So um, the next few um, slides, I really want to tell you a story of why I got interested in this gut brain um, interaction and how this came to be. Um, so as a um, uh, as you heard, I was at Henry Ford Hospital where I did my training, and what we were trying to figure out is what makes people have migraine. What happens during a migraine attack? So when I first came into this field, they felt that there was a vasoconstriction that occurred. That means the blood cell blood vessels get narrow, and patients will have. Uh, aura-like symptoms, which, um, you know, you heard from Dr. Sahai that sometimes they, they result in an aura-like weakness or numbness. So what we did was we um, had very, um, some of us in the group like me had migraine and we donated our brain um, for research and um, we went into a magnet, some of us, and migraine was triggered. And so you can see here what happens during a migraine, and you also saw that during Dr. Sahai's um, talk. So we noticed that there was a um, increase in blood flow, in fact, and then it also occurred in that brainstem. Now, the brainstem is where that autonomic system resides. So right away, you can see that that's where migraine becomes um, activated. So the areas of the brain that seem to be activated are, are listed here. And so for those of us who are not neuroanatomists, what I'd like to say is part of this is that autonomic system. And um, what we did from here on out is we took um, patients who had migraine um, where there was a spectrum where people who had either chronic migraine, which is 15 days of headache or more, or episodic migraine, and we found that there was a structure of the brain called the periaqueductal gray that seemed to be involved. And this has now been, uh, these results have now been replicated. So if you think about activation, what happens is there is an increase in blood flow and blood leaves behind iron, which we can then, um, then measure. So this has been found in certain areas of the brain, and this is what leads to that autonomic dysfunction. And one of the one of the autonomic um, dysfunction pathways is 
um, is the gut. So I got super um, interested in this. And so we, we decided to then study the gut as a hallmark of this autonomic dysfunction. You heard I worked at Swedish Hospital in Seattle. Swedish Hospital used to be a tertiary center to um, study uh, the gastric emptying. So when we eat a meal, um, it takes a certain time for the gut to transit. So this is a camera that we had where um, uh, patients, or in our case, sometimes we studied healthy volunteers or subjects, they ate an egg meal with cooked in some nuclear material or technetium, and then we're able to measure it out. So this, this uh, is a very, very standard test. I would not recommend um, everybody going through this if they feel that they have this um, gut brain dysfunction, but I'll, I'll hopefully share with you some hallmarks that I think that, um, that you may be experiencing if you have that gut brain interaction. So this slide shows the emptying of the stomach of people who don't have migraine in green, those we call, I don't call them um, normal because I have migraine and I consider myself normal. I think migraine is a disease, it's a spectrum where people have, who have more migraine have, a, um, have, have this disease where they, where they have these episodes and people who've never experienced migraine at the moment, we'll just call them um, normal controls for this particular uh, purpose. So you can see that the way the gut empties in migraine, it takes a long time. So we studied patients during a migraine, in between a migraine, and whether we studied them in between or during a migraine, there was a problem with emptying the gut. So we recently wrote, wrote a paper um, to describe this particular phenomenon. So if you'll just click through this, what this picture shows you is sometimes you may have what we call a postprandial fullness um, in that, that the stomach doesn't seem to empty as much. And this chart shows you that it's been replicated in different ways. So one was I did those studies with our team looking at patients with migraine and showed a GI dysfunction. My colleague, Linda Nguyen at Stanford looked at subjects who had gastroparesis or patients who had GI dysfunction and migraine was more common in them. Next slide, please. So we think about this as a phenomenon where there may be a um, gut brain um, interaction. And what that means is, is that among those patients who have migraine, nearly 15% of them um, have a prevalence of GI dysfunction. And so this can manifest itself not only in the gastroparesis, but also in other dysfunctions like inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, as well as GERD or this Heliobacter pylori infection. Now, some of you may start thinking about this and saying, well, wh what, how is this relevant to me? Well, the way it's relevant is if you're one of those that have trouble absorbing things or absorbing or have this gut brain interaction where you're having stomach emptying, when you take a pill for, for your um, migraine, when you have it, so we know that some patients cycle through a lot of medications that don't seem to absorb well. So this is why it becomes really relevant to see if you're part of the spectrum where you may have this gut-brain interaction. So this just shows you the whole um, spectrum. When I saw a lot of patients, I only have the privilege of seeing patients once a month because I have... Um, an industry job now where I'm hoping that I can impact a lot of patients with, um, with my knowledge. But here, um, when I saw a lot of patients, I would ask them if when they were younger, they had cyclical vomiting or that they had motion sickness because those are all hallmarks of autonomic dysfunction. So here you can see that there's a lot of overlap between migraine and other gut disorders. Um, disorders um, like we listed before, 
um, that that um, that migraine is part of the spectrum. So the GI dysfunction can manifest in itself in a lot of ways. And sometimes patients will have different um, manifestations as they go. So for one instance, I had a patient when they were younger, they had cyclical vomiting. When they got older, they had migraine. When they got a little bit older, they had less migraine, but they had functional uh, gut um, uh, functional dyspepsia. So uh, particularly when you think that you don't have this benefit from oral treatments or you have uh, fullness or you're not getting the help that you need, you may want to start exploring this, this um, spectrum of gut-brain interaction. So I'll um, sum up here. Again, it's been a huge privilege. I think that, again, Dr. Sahai really um, summed up the whole pathophysiology in terms of what makes the neuronal basis of migraine. Part of that neuronal basis is this autonomic dysfunction. It could manifest itself in, in different ways like um, dizziness or um, vertigo as well. But um, I feel privileged to have been able to detect this dysfunction um, and study gut disorders. Um, so thank you very much.